This is The Coaching In, a podcast from 3D Coaching. So I'm Claire Pedrick. Welcome to The Coaching In. Today, I'm in conversation with Georgina Woodstra about her new book, Mastering the Art of Team Coaching. Georgina, you and I have been around for a long time and never really met. So tell us a bit about you. It's, it's, it's extraordinary to think that, isn't it, Claire? It's, I think I started coaching in 1993. So, yes. um, so yeah, that is a few years ago. Um, so I am an executive coach and I specialise in chief executive and top team coaching. And I've been a passionate advocate of the coaching profession for years. Um, and and I'm a, a, also a passionate learner and I'm one of those folk who believe that the learning never stops, we never arrive, we're always uh, on a journey towards um, learning more and developing ourselves more. Uh, and I think I bring that into my coaching um, and style and space. And um, as, a, as a real advocate for the coaching profession, um, I have experienced some frustration for myself, for my own learning, in when I wanted to really start learning about team coaching. I found very little there to off, that offered me a useful guide that really came from a coaching mindset and stance. So I guess that's been the last uh, few years has really been my, my major campaign in the way to, um, to encourage the coaching profession to think about what is team coaching as to seek from all the other possibilities of, uh, of how we intervene with, team, with teams. I guess it's something also about being rather long in the tooth here. <laughs> this part of my this part of my career, it's uh, it's uh, maybe for, for other colleagues as well. It's about uh, giving back and offering offering what I can back to the future generations of the profession. And yeah. since it's part of that legacy, knowing that I don't have the answers, I just have some thoughts. Yes, and actually it's lovely to have thoughts from somebody who's done a lot of miles. Yes, it's a good way of putting it, actually. Yeah, hundreds of miles on the road, team coaching. Yeah, yeah. and hundreds and hundreds of hours. Exactly, and it's, um, there's no, I don't think there's any fast track. Of course, we can fast track conceptual learning. You can read a book and have the five box grid models or the frameworks in mind or the your own idea of what makes an effective team and that sort of thing. But it's not those things that will make you a great team coach. And it, that's where the hours of practice come in. Yeah. It's a little bit like sometimes people go on these, um, you know, singing shows on TV, like The Voice and stuff, and they want to be famous overnight. And it's, 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 sometimes as, as coaches, I think we want to be able to crack it overnight. But it's, it's the hard work on the road that teaches us Yes, I'm really interested by what you're saying and and my noticing that you're talking about the miles, because I've been thinking a lot in the last few weeks about embodied wisdom, oh. which which I would. Well, define seems rather a grandiose way of putting it, but I would I would kind of describe as when you are long in the tooth and you've had lots of experience and you've fallen over a lot. <laughs> and and noticed a lot and learned a lot and everything else sometimes I think what we've got is we've just got embodied wisdom that doesn't say we do this or we do this or we do the other it's just a whole lot of miles that have in different areas that have kind of added to our internal stance as you described earlier yes it's it's that embodied sense the I think uh, it might be Coaches Training Institute or CTI who call it in the bones. Yeah. It's, uh, it's within us, and that's part of that integrated process that happens yeah. through, through iterating, reflecting, um, trying different things, trying to find our way. Most of all, I think it's, it's much more about a, a vertical development, a development of self, than uh, about adding more and more and more. Yeah. To the yeah, totally. Yeah. I'm so tempted to follow up in a hundred areas as you've been talking, Georgina. 
But I think that our listeners are pr- probably going to be going, but what does she mean by team coaching and how different is it from facilitation or consulting? So can we go there first and then probably pick yeah. up some of those other things? I'd love to go there first because I think that's what it's all about. Um, maybe I could start by saying you know, our coaching profession uh, has, is maybe 30 years old, something like that. Of course, people will say I've been co- they've been coaching for a lot longer, but the professional body is the ones that, we, that have coaching at the heart of what we're doing, uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 years old. And um, there's, a, there's an identity in our mindset and beliefs that shapes coaches, even though there's very different schools and approaches to this. There's solutions focused coaching, there's transpersonal coaching, there's grow model based coaching, coaching for results, somatic coaching, you know, very different. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. And that's what I'm hoping will emerge over the next decade in the, in the field of team coaching. So although the, the different forms all look very different, um, in order to be called coaching, they're shared by a common set of beliefs and principles and set of competencies at the heart um, of coaching. And when I, when I uh, speak at conferences and things and ask people, why did you become a coach? You know, why did you become a coach, Claire? What attracted you to coaching? Me? Well, that's really interesting because I think I fell into it before I realised that's what I was doing. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> because when I started coaching, it wasn't a thing. Yes, so I and it didn't have a name and the job I had was called counselling, but there was nothing wrong. Uh-huh. There was no there was nothing that in the people I was talking to that needed attention. They wanted good thinking space around what they were they going to do with the rest of their lives. And what mm-hmm. attracted me was being a small part of a of a process that somebody was going through to really understand what they're here for and what they can do with their life and many of the people that I work with then went to work in in aid and development organizations across the world to do most extraordinary things Um, and they didn't need so, you know, they didn't need to look at stuff in the past and and understand it differently. They needed to think about what were the skills and the gifts that they were bringing to this moment in time mm. and how could they find their purpose? Yes. Yeah. And that was my purpose. And then like 10 years later, I read a, a magazine article and thought, oh, it's called coaching. Coaching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yet your story there. Many others, if they were listening, would be nodding in the room and, and sharing because there's something about that thinking space, that listening space. Someone is there with you for you, helping you to find your story, your gifts, your magic. You're not there diagnosing them and saying, this is who you are, this is how you are. Oftentimes, you're not even imposing your framework yeah. on them of how to make meaning about who they are, what they are, you're you're reflecting their words, their language, you're inviting them to dig deeper into what's underneath the surface of who they are and what matters to them. So when I ask people about this in in coaching conferences and things, people say, you know, what drew me to coaching was that belief in human potential. It's that belief that that, that the client has the answers within, the wisdom of the client. Um, it, people have experienced coaching since the first time I was truly listened to. Yes. I felt really safe, and you know, many more beautiful expressions like that that really show that the coach is in the mindset and embodying that philosophy of coaching. That we're there for the client and service of the client. We are not the expert in the room. So that's where it starts, and then you think about that in a team sense with with a client as the team, then, then how does the coach show up in that in a coaching related the creative coaching relationship of mutuality rather than show up as the expert? Yeah. The one with all the knowledge, the one with the models, the frameworks, the tools, the one who's doing the solution for the client. 
that's more of a consulting role in my view. Mm. But again, sometimes in talks, I say to, we'll get, we'll get small groups of people to get in a huddle and say, um, what are the attributes for consultant? What are the attributes for training? What are the attributes for facilitator? And what about a coach? And maybe a mentor as well. And you know, we've had hundreds of these conversations with people now. Commonly, it comes down to people see the consultant's role is to come in and understand a problem, provide a solution. Yeah. So that's not coaching. They understand a trainer as the trainer has the expertise. And they're trying to bring that expertise alive for the people who are the trainees. So that's not coaching. Very valuable, both of those things, but not coaching. Um, mentoring is often somebody who's got a wealth of experience, who's there to impart their experience to somebody who has less experience. Again, not coaching. And then we get to the, to the closer to the edge of where, where we get a lot of role inflation, role confusion is around facilitation. Mm. And I see a lot of people doing team training, offering consultancy team where they're the expert in the room and providing team facilitation and a lot less understanding what team coaching is. So let's look at that a bit. Um, facilitation comes from the, the etymology of its Latin, and it comes from the idea of making something easy. And, may, and many people understand facilitation as many different definitions. Uh, the common one is about managing the process so that the team or the group can focus on the content. Yeah. So facilitation is a fabulous tool um, if the team or, or group don't want to have to manage themselves. They want, and it's great when there's an instrumental outcome when you want to clarify a vision, develop a strategy, develop a plan, get some work done, get on the same page. The team end up with the outcome, but they haven't learned how to get there yeah. because they've not been managing the process themselves. Um, and one way this shows up is, Claire, if I said to you, do you ever go into a coaching session with a pre pre-determined -pre agenda? Never. How long are your coaching sessions usually? Uh, well, <laughs> because I do right-sizing at the beginning and really get people to the heart of the matter, they're often half an hour to an hour. Yeah, half an hour to an hour. Some, are, some coaches say an hour, hour and a half, two hours. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we all do it differently. Um, would you ever go in that half an hour for the first five minutes and do this? I would not. Nine o'clock to five past nine. Yeah. And then at five past nine, we're going to do that until 20 past nine. And then the last 10 minutes, we're going to do that. Yeah. So something happens when coaches get in front of a team. And it's not, it's out of awareness, I think, often. So the coach isn't aware of this shift. But they morph into a role of trainer or facilitator and show up with a pre-designed plan that, that the coach, in inverted commas, has designed and where they, they have a lot of expert knowledge. So I'm going to share with you a framework for team effectiveness. I'm going to measure you against that frame. I'm going to, going to offer you the results from some report or measurement and look at the gaps. Then I'll share with you how you can close those gaps. Um, so something has happened and they have lost that, that very subtle sense of they're not meant to be the experts in the room and it's client's agenda. Totally, because when I talk about coaching, I say if you know what you're doing, you're not coaching. Because <laughs> yeah. the point of coaching is that you're working into not knowing what you're doing and you're doing mm. the work together. And there's a lot of pressure on a team coach. It's not easy. Yeah. It's, it's a lot harder than one-to-one -one coaching totally. to stay and not knowing because um because of what we call the pulls from the team uh sometimes known in therapeutic context as counter transference or transference but the pulls from the team the team are often not necessarily in words um but but energetically or in body language saying saying you manage the process you tell us what the content's going to be. Mm. You, you, and we're going to tell you that oh, we disagree with that and that we're a high performing team anyway, or something like that. And, uh, and, you, and really, your job is there to entertain us. 
and give us a nice fun day out. And the result of that is the team actually do very little work and take little responsibility. The coach then type up the, the flip charts, send out the notes, never get looked at again. At least that, you know, that was my formative experience. Mm. Um, and I've, I've tried to pitch myself. They're all the mistakes that I made. And I found many others fall down the same rabbit holes. And, and it starts with the fact that many haven't even thought about the philosophy of coaching and how to bring up the line. And, and this was my frustration when I went to my first team coaching training course, my web, early team coaching books. Um, I thought, useful stuff, but it's not team coaching. Mm. It, it's just got the coaching word in it. It's yeah. popular. Um, so this is, this is, this is really the, uh, why it's an art, because you can't get a uh, team coaching in a box. You can't get a script mm. and a set of tools that someone can give you and go in there with guaranteed results. It's about developing our capacity to be present to what's mm. in the here and now and to work with the team and what's in the and build, create a really safe, what we call a container for the work, you know, really the stronger the container, the more work we can do. And really the success of our interventions is very much down to our own interior conditions. Mm. So the work is on ourselves to clear out all the norms to be able to consciously choose how to intervene in the moment. Yeah. And that's what I love so much, Georgina, about the ICF competencies. Because oh, yeah. I you may not have read my book, but it's about creating a container for a one-to-one. Mm, lovely. <laughs> because the ICF competencies talk about that, don't they? They talk about working in partnership and co-creating the beginning, the middle, and the end of a conversation yeah. in partnership. And you're just describing a partnership of more than you and them. You and one person, it's you and many people. So that leaves an extra added complexity of where you notice and how you build trust and how you co-create that container. So it's the same and yet it's so very not the same. And how you access the collective intelligence. Yes. So if you just use the basic coach competencies, um, how that sometimes plays out with coaches who are starting to work with teams. Let's say you've got a team of eight people is they ask the team a question. What's, your, what's the purpose of being a team? Why be a team, let's say. And that they will make sure that each person answers. They'll facilitate it and make sure each person answers. They'll, in the, the, the result would be they'll get eight different responses from each other. Then where are you going? Um, so part of the art is, uh, is not being the um, traffic cop and fielding all those all those different answers. Yeah. Part of it is giving the responsibility back to the team to what they do with what they've heard. Because if you really think about it, it's um, it's essential um, skill for teams to be able to shift from many to one. Yes. How do we go from the eight to the team's voice? To, mm. to make to make good use of that collective wisdom. So when the coach does it um, for the team, um, by say just handing it back to the leader, or sometimes I see them putting things up on the flip chart and then using voting dots or something like that. That's imposing a process on the team rather than coaching the team to develop their own skill or process. Yeah, and what you've just described there is that the way to not do it is to turn it into one-to-many coaching because one-to-many coaching is group coaching. And that's different, isn't it? Because you're not talking about the identity of the group. And in team coaching, it's about the team as a team intact. And the group coaching, the client is the individual. Yes, totally. Learning there and growing. And the group is in service of the individual. 
in team coaching, the individual is in service and the coach is in service of the team. Yeah. And it's only through that approach that the whole can be more than some parts. Mm. It's only then you can get to the collective wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. So what are the benefits of team coaching if somebody's listening and they're working in an organisation and thinking about how they can work more effectively as a team? What are the benefits to them? Well, if I, if I start responding by that, as a, a, maybe at, the, at an even higher level, is why, you know, why team coaching really matters so much now. Uh, and then come on to what the benefits, because I think it's very topical, um, especially now. Uh, if you actually heard of Otto Sharma, who, who developed um, Theory U, he's a MIT Stone lecturer. And I love his words where he says, you know, we put collectively creating results that nobody wants. That's mm. quite profound, isn't it? Mm. And if you just let that roll around your, um, your imagination, think about your own experience, how, how much of the time we're looking out of our, on, onto the top, which the windows are called, that results that are hugely painful, confusing, traumatizing. Um, and, and mankind has created that. Um, so collectively, we need to think and act and be different. Um, and we need a different approach to leadership and problem solving. We're, we're so far beyond the point where one heroically took on times. And collaboration is the key, working together is the key. Mm. And through collaboration, we can solve these existential crises and, and intractable problems. And in fact, we have to. If we're at a stage where we absolutely must achieve more of this. But we have to have a new story that's based on who we are as global citizens with a mindset of the collective foot rather than, than my bit. So it's a story of we before I, and yet that's not been our conditioning. You think about the last... 20, 30 years of self-help books. It's been Awaken the Giant Within. It's about me climbing my own career ladder. It's about uh, self-actualization and my own potential. And leadership development has followed that, where the investment has been in the individual leader, programs developing the individual leader, very little development of um, people's capacity to lead teams or to be an effective team and to collaborate. So we've developed the eye, and the eye is stronger than it's ever been. Mm. And that's that's not working clearly for us. Um, and you could say even things like Brexit and stuff are, are re reinforcing the eye of Britain, you know, putting up the yeah, um, putting up the drawbridge. Um, and we see that iteration in other parts of the world. So if that's the premise that collaboration is needed, then um, think about globalization, the global markets in this COVID has driven um, a huge shift to virtual work. Now organizations can hire from anywhere in the world. There's going to be a global opportunity and fight for the best talent. Workforces are likely to be virtual and um, freelance, taken on a project basis for who's fit for opportunities. People may move around the world, but we know that for others. So, um, so their success will depend on their ability to collaborate, to get involved, to be clear on and, and share outcomes and to work towards the common, the common good. Um, so we're really at a you know, society level change and we can't separate that out from organisational life. So then we look to organisational life, which every organisation I know is structured into teams. Teams are the unit of work, but less than one in 10 teams are effective. Mm. Not even close to high performing. In fact, many, I was speaking to somebody in a, um, a, a, a coach in the NHS this morning, he was saying so many teams are uh, dysfunctional and in pain, and they don't know how to get unstuck from that situation. Um, so so we've structured our organizations into teams. 
we've developed the individual. We, the individuals are targeted with KPIs or performance indicators. Individuals are rewarded on individual success. And then we're saying, we've hired a bunch of smart people. Why the hell don't they work together? Yeah. And, and none of their development in, a, in, a, um, in their organizational life or very little, it's been about how do we collaborate. Mm. So at this very early stage. And so what organizations can benefit from is the opportunity to start to create a cultural shift in their organization towards a we mindset and towards collaboration. And one team coaching program, one team on I mean, we're looking at maybe a 10 to 20 year shift here. Think how long coaching has been um, in existence and, and the impact it's had on people's leadership styles, mm. which changed as a consequence. So together as coaches, we can shift the organizational world towards the art of collaboration, towards a mindset and identity we both for organizational success and for the greater good. And it will take time and patience because as human beings, I wasn't grown up or I didn't grow up, I wasn't developed, trained, taught, educated by family or by school or by work about collaboration. Yeah. Or about other caring about the book to that degree, um, or about caring towards collective outcomes. Mm. Um, so, we're doing our part in the evolution of the planet in a way. I know mean, that can sound a bit grandiose, but I think we have to frame it in that context because uh, sometimes people say, Well, why aren't organizations buying more team coaching? And it's really because we're the frame of reference of organizations. Right? Yeah. We look at the past and what organizations have been doing is running away days, uh, framed around um, Myers Big Briggs or other kinds of uh, tools, um, which about the individual in the system, not about the we. The we. Yeah. yeah. It's a long answer there. <laughs> That's really interesting because there's so many things, aren't there, to pay attention to. Um, I've been having some conversations with some coaches in Africa and in South Africa, they've got a thing called Ubuntu coaching, which is about oh. I am because we are. Yeah. And I just wonder whether they might overtake us in relation to some of the work that's being Hopefully. done with teams because, yeah, because there's a, there's an, an international or international perspective that's more collective interesting isn't it yes i might frame that slightly differently for me in the in the yeah you know, i really believe in this idea that that we're, we're teachers and we're students yeah um and that's a never-ending cycle so uh what are we teaching to co coaches leaders people in south africa what have we taught in the past uh, what are we now learning from them is that, is that slow um, totally. But unfortunately, sometimes being a, a teacher uh, has traditionally been framed in a hierarchy. Yeah. The guru and the bottom, not the learner. Mm. And so our teachers need to make a shift and become demonstrably learners to yeah. have the humility to uh, display what we don't know or what we realize we haven't understood or what we what we've been given by somebody else as a gift of insight and learning. Yeah, yeah. So one of the questions I'm asked a lot or, or have people who I supervise in coaching mm. kind of download about is the challenge of team coaching virtually. Oh, yes. So is that in your book? Um, it's not enough in the book. Um, However, we have a bonus chapter on the book website. The book website's Mastering the Art of Team Coaching.com. <laughs> Unsurprising. <laughs> and my dear colleague and friend, Alan de Jong, wrote a chapter on, on virtual team coaching. It's available to anyone. To oh, download. brilliant. And the reason we kept it as a bonus chapter is um, we believe that 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 the world of virtual working and therefore virtual team coaching is changing and emerging so fast, evolving so fast, 
that anything put down in paper in a book um, will be outdated within months, yes. alone years. Yes. So it gives us the flexibility to keep keep learning from the emerging future around yeah. virtual team coaching. However, Claire, one thing I would say that, that fascination experience over of the last 18 months was um, on our team coaching training programs. Um, a year and a half ago, we had people who were going, oh, I don't know that I'll do it now, it's virtual. I think I'll wait till we go back into the classroom. Um, I hope we go back to doing, to working with teams in person and just can't get the same connection virtually. And the connection we have experienced, the depth we have experienced, the emotion of humanity we experienced virtually, over this last 18 months has blown my mind and blown the mind of the people in our community. Mm. And uh, so again, it's sort of, I suppose, proven to me that uh, how much our beliefs limit yeah. possibility. So if we, ha- if we hold the belief that virtual team coaching can be amazing, can be human, can be connected, can be obedient, then how do we lean into that potential and let that be our guide rather than shut it down by saying it's, it's, it, it's not going to be as good? Yeah. I think it's harder, as, as in it takes more energy. Um, but well, that doesn't mean that it's not okay. Yeah. And maybe that's just now because it's yeah. new to us. Still. Yeah. It's, you know, we're babies, aren't we? It's, yeah. We're falling over a lot of time stumbling, getting up again. In some ways, I find it easier rather than harder. And um, often because when I used to team, coach teams uh, in person, because um, team members are often distributed you know, where they live geographically, it's not necessarily that uh, possible to each other. Um, it, it would often be a day, a day and a half. Thing. So long sessions because of the effort of getting everyone yeah. together. And now, often my team coaching sessions are an hour and a half. Yeah. Two hours. Uh, but, but way more frequent. Yeah. Because we don't have all of that um, administrative that are bringing people together. So my encouragement to team coaches and is to say, how do we work with the opportunity? How do we change the way we did something to, to learn a fraction, to make it more opportunity and um, experiment yeah. to find new ways that work? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, because, yeah, we're in a new world. A new world. New, learning new things is challenging. Yeah. We're learning to drive and being exhausted off the road, as we said. <laughs> Yeah. So it's not surprising we're tired when we're first doing virtual. Yeah. Thank you. So people can get that bonus chapter on mastering the art of teamcoaching.com. That's right, yes. And um and uh no, I was gonna say I think it might be on our website teamcoachingstudio.com. I'm not sure the bonus chapter is okay. there might be some of the chapter or there will be shortly. Brilliant. We're still working on it. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much because I think you've given people a lot of things to think about um, and and some good uh, insights and challenges where people can make their own meaning. And of course, that's coaching, isn't it? It is coaching. And I have to say, Claire, your, your skill at coaching shines through in how you conduct this podcast. Because thank you. you. So present on this and so creative and collaborative and it's felt like a really generative conversation um, so anyone who's listening to this this is what Claire's creative is what yeah, team coaching is its best for you know, a conversation that builds meaning mm. and that creates meaning so, thank you and when we don't know where we're going right <laughs> Yeah, that's good. I mean, that's yeah. that's what it's about, isn't it? It is. It is. And through, through trust in the process, we end up in a better place than we did before. 
Yeah. And um, one coach in Fully Claire once said to me, I, and stuck with me because I love I love metaphors and visual. He said, it's like thinking about um, trapeze artists. You know, we swing backwards and forwards on your trapeze. At some point, you have to trust and not go and trust you're going to be caught. And, and that's the flow of coaching. So yeah. Trusting those Yeah, and it's about courage, isn't it? Oh, so much so. That's my next book. <laughs> oh, good. Which is going to be about the underneath things that we need to master coaching the underneath as in interior yeah well the things that are so so there's the competences aren't there but actually the thing that defines somebody who's really able to be fully present for somebody is is the kind of in between things that connect those together and one of those is courage Mm -hmm. So interesting times. That that really resonates for me. And and I'm so curious about how you would define courage. What is courage? I think courage is a thousand things, isn't it? And one of it is, is not knowing when you start offering or asking or noticing having absolutely no idea about what's going to happen next. And I think it's about um, tolerating that internal. (gasps) And I know that as we get more experienced, our internal (gasps) is takes longer to show up because we are comfort zone of courage expands, doesn't it? But there's always going to be a place where we go, I don't know what I'm doing here. And I think courage is is about trust, as what you said, it's about trusting the process. One of my little theories that I'm just testing out about one-to-one coaching is I think that in most one-to-one conversations, there's a moment where that happens. And I think that that beginner coaches but actually also many experienced coaches that's the moment where they lose the edge and where it becomes a little bit more transactional because they because tolerating that level of not knowing is so so risky dangerous hard exciting whatever it is and I think that that how we manage that moment actually demonstrates some of the qualities of real deep present being with somebody how we manage our not knowing yeah um, is part of building that courage mm. and and i guess to me i, I could um i might expand on that to say I think it's I, about not knowing. I think it's also about not needing to be in control. Yeah. And I think it's also about letting go of the need to perform, of being seen to be the one who's adding the value. Um, and all of that sounds easy. <laughs> and, and it's generated through the miles on the road. Yeah. And um, ultimately what, what makes the mastery is is those interior conditions and this is where um, beautiful things like mindfulness and those practices are really I think helping coaches to separate from the noise that's created the fear, the anxiety the tensions, the pressure between ourselves to separate from it and be really present in it I'm really interested you said that because it's made me make a connection that I don't think I've ever made before. So Nancy Klein says that when we're experiencing a high level of a high level of emotion, we can't think. But actually, when we're experiencing a high level of emotion, when courage is required, our capacity to be 
in that moment is massively reduced, isn't it? And that's why we need to work on courage and not knowing and all those other things, because otherwise our anxiety massively reduces our capability to do other things. So, so I might, I might differ on the emotion. I agree with you on anxiety. So man, managing that anxiety and finding ways to still that water and turn yeah. that water of anxiety. Um, and in team coaching, our, our emotions uh, and our capacity to sense is one way that we, we tune into the field. Mm. physical feel the atmosphere um, that is that collective space um, so it's one of the one of the better skills as we call it team coaching students play the yeah uh, it's a lot of use of self yeah. yeah so we could carry on for another podcast now we could perhaps we'll have you back for another one that'd be great <laughs> So how do people get in touch with you, Georgina? Thanks for asking, Claire. Um, teamcoachingstudio.com mm-hmm. is our website. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Georgina Woodstrom. And, um, and I'm, I love connecting with people, so I'm very happy to connect with people there. Great. The other thing that's a real joy is um, we have a, a community of practice uh, with about 500 you know, team coaches around the globe, or people with an interest in team coaching around the globe, um, in so many different languages and geographies. And um, that's free to join. Um, you go onto our website and look under the menu community, and you get notified of all sorts of things. So last night we had a community meetup that was. Um, was stimulated by the call, um, but but rather than be a lecture from the one person running the webinar up front, uh, we really work on exploring the collective policy, collective meaning. So um, we're very very interested in in uh, stimulating and being catalysts for and generating other voices on the internet culture. Um, and, and hoping that the field will develop their coaching project in many different ways. Brilliant. That sounds so amazing. Everyone, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. And I learned so much from other people mm. um, in that. And um, yeah, it's a real, it's a real treasure of something that's happened over the last 18 weeks. So, Great. So anyone who wants to, please do. Thank you. Up with us there and we'd like to, I'd love, I'd love to connect. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And if people want to read your book, it's called Mastering the Art of Team Coaching by Georgina Woodstra. So thank you, Georgina, for your wisdom, your sharing, your generosity and your time. Uh, I'm Claire Pedrick and I've been talking to Georgina Woodstra and we're both MCCs. How about that? How about that? (laughs) Thank you so much, Claire. I've really, really enjoyed our time together today. Me too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, please share the podcast with a friend who might also be interested. And if you'd like to become one of our regulars at The Coaching Inn, you can subscribe at Podbean or on iTunes. We look forward to meeting you on the next podcast. You've been listening to The Coaching Inn. Find out more about us at www.3dcoaching.com.